Hello and welcome to Safe Pasture. My name is Sherry Hammers. We are in the middle of a fascinating study on the journey through the tabernacle. And we see here that this is God's blueprint for us having a thriving relationship with Him, each one of us, our relationship to God. These things affect it. These things will make it stronger if we implement and apply these to our lives in the order that God is looking for. If you were with us last time, we were talking about how sometimes people get upset because prayers aren't answered or there's just some kind of hindrance. And we were talking about how strange fire could be the culprit. Um, I'm not going to go through all of that again. Please look at that video if you need a little context for what we're talking about. We're going to continue talking about the strange fire and how that has an impact in our life if we're bringing strange fire before God. I wanted to start off with Revelations 8, 5. It says, And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Only those, therefore, whose sin is atoned for can worship. That's not part of the scripture. That's a little note that I put there. But only, only the people who their sin is atoned for can worship. That's kind of what we were talking about last time. But going from that scripture, it says that the angel taketh the censer and he filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it upon the earth. So in the pulpit commentary, they said the angel now returns to the altar of burnt offering. Remember, that's the one that is represents our repentance before God, where atonement is, is taken care of, and where he takes the fire which he casts upon the earth. This action denotes that God's judgments are about to descend on the earth, and it therefore forms the visible token of God's acceptance of the prayers of the saints and his answer to them. And Exodus 30, verse 9, we're going to go on to that one. Ye shall offer no strange incense thereon, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering, neither shall ye pour drink offering thereon. And in Ellicott's commentary, he says here about you shall offer no strange incense. By strange incense is meant any that was composed differently from that of which the composition is laid down in Exodus 30, 34 through 35. And then he says, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering, neither drink offering. All these were to be offered on the brazen altar not on the altar of incense, which was in no way suited for them. The altar of incense was not built for atonement like the brazen altar was. Now, going back to Leviticus 10, 1, which we talked about in our last time together, Bullinger said, I, I wanted to reiterate this, the introduction of anything strange. So it, I'm sorry, let me back up. It says, commanded them not. So the introduction of anything strange where all is ordered by God is abomination in his sight. Remember we talked about God has an order. He's not a God of confusion, but of order. So when God says, this is the way I want it done. Well, when the sons of Aaron said, no, nah, we're going to do it how we like. We don't really care about pleasing you. We want to please ourselves. God said, no, that's an abomination. And Bullinger goes on to say, and the abomination calls for and calls down his judgment. Thus, the first recorded individual use of incense began in disobedience in Leviticus 10.1, and the last ended in unbelief, Luke 1, 1, 10, 18, and 20. He's talking there, if you recall, and we, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But when Zechariah, remember Zechariah, went into the holy place, as it was his, he was his turn to go in and offer the incense in the holy place. And that's when the angel Gabriel came to Zechariah and said, your prayers have been heard. Your prayers have been heard for a son. And Zechariah is like, how am I going to know that's true? He, he, he was... 
he was he was astounded, but he reacted not in like remember Mary was visited by Gabriel too, and she said, "Well, how will this be since I don't know a man?" She was just saying, "I believe you, but I was just wondering how is this going to happen." That's not what Zechariah said. He said he didn't, how, how could he even know this was true? And at that, Gabriel said, I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent here to give you this message directly from him. And because you're speaking unbelief, you'll be silenced until what the full course of, of time of this baby being born. You're going to, um, you're going to be muted so that you can't speak anymore in belief. That's a whole nother teaching. But getting back to what Bullinger said, he said, so the first use, first recorded individual use of incense began in disobedience with the sons of Aaron and God struck them down. And the last one, which was Zechariah, ended in unbelief. And let's remember that this incense is representing our prayers our prayers going up to the throne of God. And when you go, okay, here's, here's a huge lesson in this. When you go to God and you say, all right, God, this is, these are things I need. I really don't care how you want this done. I just need them and I need you to answer me. Um, that's going to probably draw down judgment on your life, just like it did for Aaron's sons. God doesn't, God is not going to, he's not some kind of cosmic bellboy that just, when you say jump, he says how high. That is not how God operates. And Bullinger, I thought, I thought this was really interesting. Bullinger goes on to note the three fires in these verses. Uh, we're going to look at Leviticus 9.24. This is the fire of true worship. And there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. So true worship. These people were, were doing things according to the way God said to do it. And God responded with fire that came out and consumed the offering. When it consumed the offering, that meant that God accepted it. He accepted that as true worship. They did what God said. They did it exactly how God said to do it. They did not let their flesh change it in any way, shape, or form. The second type of fire that Bullinger notes here is the strange fire of false worship. We talked about this one last time out of Leviticus 10.1. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Now, come on, parents. You know what it's like when you tell your children not to do something. And they go against it fully knowing what you wanted and they just rebel against it. That is not a time you want to go bless your child. That's a time where you have to mete out some, some consequences, some judgment. He says the third type of fire is the devouring fire of judgment. Leviticus 10, 2 and 3. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them. Talking about a, a Nadab and Abihu. And they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, this is that. This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. And then in, um, on, on verse 3 of, of chapter 10 that I just read, Bullinger says this, All worship which has not Christ for its object, the glory of Jehovah for its end, and the Holy Spirit for, his power, for its power, will be rejected and judged. Let me repeat that. All worship which has not Christ for its object, the glory of Jehovah for its end, and the Holy Spirit for its power, will be rejected and judged. I mean, that, that gives me chills. Even now, I, I'm getting chills because I look at some of the worship that has gone on in the contemporary church and 
if you if you have had your eyes open and you look at the lyrics always look at the lyrics words have power when you see what is the focus of this song is this is this song for God's glory or does it just make me feel cozy and cuddly and fuzzy warm all over that God loves me so much? Is the focus on me or is the focus on God? You use just that one little litmus test and you're going to knock a lot of, of worship songs that are being used in the church today. They're going to have to be cut off and you know, laying on the floor, they're, they're going to have to go. Because God says he will not share his glory with another. And if your worship, even if it's compelling music, even if the lyrics, just everything just seems like it's, it's so catchy and stays in your head all day and makes you feel good. I'm telling you, if you're offering this to God as worship, you need to be careful. God says what he will accept for worship and what he won't accept for worship. And I was going to move forward, but it looks like I'm out of time again. Anyway, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for tracking with me. This, this is a fascinating study, and every time I get into it, it encourages me. Um, if you would like to leave a comment, question, if you'd like to share this out or like it, I would really appreciate that. And by the way, I really do appreciate interaction with you viewers because I this is all about what I want to, to do as part of the kingdom of God. I want to encourage you. This world is crazy right now, and there seems to be so much darkness, but God's word is our light, and Jesus himself is light. And when we can encourage each other in him, we both get encouraged and refreshed. So please leave me a comment or a question, and um, I would really appreciate that. You have a blessed day, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.